chapter 16, and I thought, I, was good. I thought maybe I could finish, you know. I thought, yeah, I should be able to finish this. And then I looked at, like, let me read you this one verse and right at the end. Now, to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel, uh-oh, that's going to take some explaining, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, uh-oh, that's... <laughs> So with what I've got, I've got like two pages of notes here, and then throwing that in on top of it, there's no way. I'd have to just fly through it. So one more, and we should be finished, or willing. Yeah, that's what I always say, you know. I'm, I'm like the, the ending to this. You know, it's got like three or four endings um, in Romans. I think I'm the same way. I'm finding out, I find out when I'm preaching, I'm, I'm missing whole points and things, you know. Oh, it's getting terrible. So, and I, people tell me, you did this, or you didn't say this, and I, oh, I need to correct that. But I never can remember to correct it. So, you know, just, yeah. I mean, you know, there are things, oh, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to add that. That was really good. Somebody will say something to me, I say, that's really good. But I never remember it. Uh, it's terrible. Anyway, um, Look at verse 17 and 18. We're just going to pick it up right there. Remember, we did, we've already had one ending here. In verse, actually, uh, I'm not sure if he's counting. Because I'll tell you what, it looks like it's more than, <laughs> might be five. Um, let me see here real quick. So you get an ending in verse 33 of chapter 15, now the God of peace be with you all, amen. Then we chart, start chapter 16. And then in verse 16, he says, salute one another with a holy kiss. The church of Christ salutes you. Okay? And maybe that's the second one right there. So one and two, and then there's, there should be two more after that. I guess that's right. There's four, four, four total. Anyway, we'll get, we'll get to that. He says there in verse 17 and 18, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are to such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So, you know, Paul just got done writing them, you know, 16 chapters or 15 chapters, and we all know there's a lot of doctrine in, in Romans. That's why it's not one of the books they recommend that you give a Christian to read first, even though it's the first in the Pauline epistles. It's got so much deep doctrine in it that you're better off to have them go over to 1 Thessalonians and read that. And 1 Thessalonians kind of sets the pace because it talks about the second coming of Christ in every chapter. Without that in mind, without that knowing that he's coming back, without that knowledge of the rapture that it talks about in chapter 4, I don't know, it's just something Christians don't do well when they're not anchored in on that. The uh, Bible says that every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. It's just anticipating that happening. So now he's talking about uh, three areas. Actually, there's, these are uh, areas of separation. The Bible talks about at least three areas of separation for the believer. We'll get, let's go ahead and go through those real quick. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, I've heard it said there's primary separation, secondary separation. I don't know if I really like that. These are just areas of separation where a Christian is told to withdraw himself or to uh, avoid someone, um, and for good reason. They'll have a negative effect on you. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 17, yoking up with unbelievers. Okay, now, before I read this, don't get it in your mind that, you know, you can withdraw yourself from the lost world because you can't. But you can decide who you're going to go into business with. You can decide who you're going to marry. You can decide who you're going to have a, a very close friendship with. Okay, and it does, it is meaning all those things because he mentions fellowship in here. Not just linking up with someone in, in, in marriage or in business, but in, and I'm not saying you can't have lost friends. We probably all have somebody that's lost that we consider a friend. But can you have a close relationship with unsaved people? I don't know how you can. 
You know, I guess I, I'm not talking about, you know, going over for a dinner or a lunch or something like that. I'm talking about spending some serious time with them and they're unsaved and they're, you know, I don't know. It's just, that's always, it's, it's always been, let's put it this way. I've never really had to depart from them, but I sure have had them depart from me. I mean, if you've got any walk or testimony at all, they're just not going to be able to stomach you. So, in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, he says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? <clears throat> For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord. There's your separation right there. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So, every, you know, younger Christians, the, the, you try to tell them, you know, about, and I, I know that marry unsaved people, uh, you know, sometimes they marry an unsaved person, they win them, sometimes. Uh, sometimes they don't. I don't know if you're willing to take the risk, but I wouldn't. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's several ways to create hell on earth for yourself. There's one of them <laughs> right there. Maybe go to war is the other one, but being married to someone that, has, that wants nothing to do with your Savior, well, you know, see if God calls you to the mission field. And if he did call you, you couldn't go. And if you could go, you'd find that you got an anchor around your neck. You see, it just, that's why it tells you, you know, why are you yoking up with an unbeliever? And uh, it, it's, it's convincing folks not to do that. Business partners, that's the same way, man. You know, you get somebody that you're chained to. You know, the problem with the yoke is you all have to go the same direction. You, that, that's the problem with the yoke. When you're yoked to Jesus Christ and you're going in the same direction he is, that's great. But when you're yoked to an unbeliever and they want to go this way and the Lord wants you to go this way, well, guess what? You're going that way because you're in the yoke with them. You can't get away from them. And the same way with friendships, you know, it can, I don't know. I rarely ever hear of it. And, 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 and I say that acquaintances and things like that, I, I have no problem with that. I'm just, I don't know how. It's like families that, and I realize family is a little bit different. If you have a lot of unsaved family, there's a lot more fellowship going on there. But even then, even then, it just, just something there. I mean, I, you know, uh, my mom and dad, my mom and dad were unsaved uh, a good portion of my Christian life. Now, my mom ends up getting saved, and thank God for that. And that was toward the end. But I'll tell you what, I considered the church more my family than it did them. And I love my mom and dad. But there was just not that witness, that, that common denominator of Jesus Christ, and it made a difference. And it also, well, you know, it, it also put a separation between us on a lot of things. Man, they didn't see things the way I saw them, you know. Um, look at um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll go there first. There's two, two passages here on this one. So separation from yoking up with unbelievers. Here's the second one. It's brethren who walk disorderly. Okay, one is unsaved people. That's why they call that primary separation. It's funny that Christians today never get around to secondary separation at all. Of separating, separating themselves from brethren or sisterin that walk disorderly. Okay? And he says there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. He's about to tell you how. And not after the tradition which you received of us. I'll tell you, you say, well, what kind of tradition was that? Well, the tradition was that Paul worked when he had to work. He wasn't, he, he, you couldn't accuse Paul of, you know, uh, uh, being lazy and relying on the system to take care of him, relying on the ministry to take care of him. He wouldn't allow that. Whenever he got any type of feedback where there was neg negative press against him, he wouldn't take nothing from him. Should he have been able to? Absolutely. They that preach the gospel should live in the gospel. But as an apostle, 
he would not allow that so he's working he's doing double duty he's not only doing the ministry but in his in what spare time he has he's making tents he says um, so if there's any tradition that he established it's if you want to work or if you want to eat work um, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after tradition which uh, he received of us for yourselves know how you ought to follow us for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you neither did we eat any man's bread for naught and that's for nothing they were getting they were getting something in return <laughs> but wrought with labor and travail night and day there's double duty that we might not be chargeable to any of you not because we have not power because they did but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us for even when we were with you this we commanded you that if any would not work neither should he eat that should be the welfare system in America now if somebody can't work we all understand that <laughs> okay we're not cruel but if they can work and they won't work then I don't care if they eat you've never watched anybody starve to death that that can't work and would or wouldn't work they'll work eventually <laughs> But, they, but as long as they got their hand out and we'll work for food, but ain't planning on getting in the car and doing any work for you. He says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. This thing is serious with God. I mean, we, don't, we, we kind of poo-poo it like it doesn't, oh, well, you know. But to God, this is a serious thing. He says, Working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, there's the problem. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. I think he goes on to say, and I didn't write down the, uh, our, uh, copy the rest of it. Um, let's see, second, where, where am I at here? Second Thessalonians. Is it verse 14? Yeah, let me get over there real quick. Three, six, twelve. Yeah, yeah. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him, uh, that he may be ashamed. So it's pretty serious with God, a man that won't work. Now let's turn to First Corinthians five eleven. So that's one way that if a brother walks disorderly, you're to withdraw yourself from him. Here's several other, several other ones. 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. It didn't say he was a brother. It said he's called a brother. You know, a lot of times when you see people that are uh, walking after the flesh, okay, they actually might be walking in the flesh. Because if they're walking in the flesh, what does that say? They're lost. But they could be walking after the flesh, and you really can't tell the difference. So it's like the verdict is out. That's why he says, if a man that's called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, was such a one know not to eat. And every now and then you're going to come across someone like that, and the Bible says, you know, you're not fellowship with them. Now, I want, I want to add something. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 3. Go back there again. And look at verse 13 to 15. Talking about that brother walking disorderly, he says, But ye, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, I think I was reading that, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy but admonish him as a brother. Okay? This is not, you know, now we hate so-and-so. Everybody in the church, we got to hate so-and-so. <laughs> no, you don't have to hate them. You, you don't even have to, you, know, you ought to feel sorry for them. You ought to pray for them. But the problem is, if, if everybody just reinforces and enables them, what's going to happen? It, whatever they're into is going to spread. But when everybody withdraws, they should be ashamed of what they're doing, and they should correct themselves. That's the purpose of it. So there's two reasons right there for separating yourself from, uh, from
from Christians, or, or excuse me, from uh, the unsaved, or one for the unsaved and one for Christians. One's walk, one is unsaved and you're not to have fellowship with them. The other is saved, or at least says they are, but they're not walking before the Lord right. And then here's the last one that we've just covered in this text, and that's teaching false doctrine. And I'll tell you what, churches do not, do not ever teach this. At least the, very few of them do. Uh, they tell you that doctrine's really not uh, worth being divisive over. And I'm telling you that doctrine is worth being divisive over. <laughs> Paul said there, let me get back to the verse here. Paul said, uh, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them. <laughs> As a pastor, I'm going to mark them. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. So we're to, we're to like call, call them out and say, okay, so-and-so is teaching this, so beware of that because here's what Paul wrote about that. Here's what Paul said about that. Here's what the Bible teaches about that. Beware. You mark them. Uh, and then you withdraw yourself from them. Um, look at 2 John. Second John, verse 10 and 11. Now, some of this has to do with trib doctrine, but look, I want you to get the principle behind it. He says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So when the, when the Mormon gets ready to leave, whatever you do, don't say, God bless you. <laughs> say, see ya. Or, in fact, I won't be seeing you, but... Um, See, the doctrine in question that Paul's talking about is something that's contrary to what he's, he's already taught them. To us, it's everything that's revealed, all the revelation of the Pauline epistles. You've got the entire Bible in front of you. And I've told you before that the, the Pauline epistles are, are for a Christian in this age the filter for not getting caught up in false doctrine that the rest of the Bible might be teaching. Like, it's like eternal security. Eternal security is one of those things that's taught in the Pauline epistles, not taught in the book of James, not taught in the book of Hebrews, not taught in the book of Matthew, not taught in the Old Testament. But because it's Pauline, if you teach contrary to it, you're a heretic. So, you mark them, you separate yourself from them, and the reason you are marking them based upon what? What Paul taught. That's how you're marking them. And, of course, the rest of the Bible, too, all depends on what they're teaching. I mean, there's so much heresy out there. There's a, there's a, there's a, it seems like there's a heresy for everything. Uh, you can spend all your time refuting heresies if you want. I, I can spend all my time doing that from the pulpit. There are so many heresies out there. Um, and that's just getting toward the end time, too. Paul talked about the, that, you know, heresy is the work of the flesh. Well, there's plenty of flesh out there. So you're good, the heresies will just keep growing and growing. And, a lot, and what's funny is there's nothing new. They've already been around. They're just circling back around, you know. It's like the, it's like the swirl in a the toilet. They're just coming back around again. And they've already been, they've already been debunked or they've already been... Uh, thoroughly rebuffed from the scriptures, but here they come again. I mean, Calvinism, are you, are you serious? Post-millennialism? No Christian should be falling for that the second time or third time or however many times it's been around, but yet they do. So, what do you do when somebody comes into the church and all of a sudden you find out, uh-oh, they're not our stripe. They're not, they don't believe the Bible like we believe it. Well, you avoid them. And if I have to, I ask them to leave. Doesn't matter what they can add to us. Doesn't matter how rich they are or how much tithe money they can put in the offering. Doesn't matter. We preserve, we preserve this church, what we believe. Okay? We all believe the King James Bible, the Word of God. Why would I let somebody in here that didn't believe it and just in there infect everybody? Or a Calvinist or, or anything like that. 
Now, there are minor things that we don't, I mean, there's things we don't all agree on. I mean, there's certain things you don't agree with me and I don't agree with you. That's okay. They're small things. But the major doctrines, you ought to have that settled. I mean, I had that settled first year at Bible Institute. <laughs> I haven't changed anything because I got it right the first time. I saw it. I said, there it is. The Lord said, there it is. There it is. You know, why, why do you keep questioning what God's already showed you? You don't do that. Now, if you believe something that you can't find Scripture for, and Scripture doesn't support it, okay, look into it. But the rapture? <laughs> you can't find Scripture for that? I can find plenty. So I'm not changing my mind about it just because it didn't happen when somebody thought it should have. Oh, it's going to happen all right. Okay. Um, look at... Uh, Verse 18. Verse 18 says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So what Paul's telling you is that um, these folks that are teaching that aren't, aren't, aren't doing it with good intentions. Even though you may think they are, or they may tell you they are, they're not. Not according to this. According to this, they serve their own bellies. Now, if you look at Ecclesiastes 6, 7, I'll just read it to you. It says, all the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. Um, when he says there that they serve their own bellies, you know, that also has to do with the labor of man, because that's for his mouth. It's, it's about his wages. It's about money. And then the money goes in the mouth, you know. Um, and you'll find people that it's, it's usually about something like that. They're, um, um, they want something or they want to break out and do something. They want to take something. I mean, sometimes they want to take over churches. You don't think that happens. Man, we have seen it happen. I mean, they'll come, we, we call them wolves. They'll come into the church and man, when the pastor spots them, and usually nobody else does right away. And usually they are just so wonderful, but you're like, their doctrine is horrendous. And I tell you, there's a church not too far from here that used to run 1,700 people on Sunday. And they chose them a new pastor after one retired. And, buddy, they got a Calvinist and didn't know it. And he nearly took them down to nothing. And they barely got rid of him and his ilk that came with him before he took down the whole church. It happens. That's why the Bible warns you. And the Bible says to mark them and avoid them. All right, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so. In other words, not only to mark the ones that are contrary to you in doctrine, but also them that uh, are, are teaching the way, you mark them. As you have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. Uh, I think this has to do with, with uh, Jews, them of his own uh, um, family and things, even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. He said that in Romans 11, that they were enemies for the gospel's sake. He says, whose end is destruction, individually this is true, whose God is their belly. Man, there it is again and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Usually every, it's, a, it's amazing how every major false doctrine seems to be about the things down here. Because if you don't believe the rapture, you must believe you're staying. And if you believe you're staying, you're believing there's going to be a golden age. And if you believe there's going to be a golden age, you must believe you're going to prosper. And if you must believe you're going to prosper, you must think that the whole world's going to get saved. And then there's going to be a thousand years of peace that the church brings in, not the Lord. It's all about earthly things. This is it. We might as well enjoy it. God help us if this is it. God help us. And it's not it. This ain't even close to be it. Thank God this ain't it. You might, be, you might be thanking God on your knees in November. Thank God this ain't it.
because it's over. <laughs> it says, whose God is their belly. That's what they're thinking about. They're thinking about what they have, what they're going to have, how well they're going to eat, how well they're going to enjoy their life right down here. Man, you've got the wrong idea. I'm not saying you can't enjoy life. You should. I, I enjoy life. But I'll tell you what, right now, it's a time for sacrifice. It's a time for service. It's a time for winning people to Jesus Christ while you have the time and giving God, giving God that part of your life and sacrificing it on an altar. I mean, the Lord sacrificed for you, sacrificed for Him. You were not going to regret it. Remember, this ain't it. What's coming is it. you got a whole thousand years to rejoice and to enjoy yourself, and we will. We will. We will enjoy ourselves. Man, we will be sinless, immortal beings on this planet, serving Jesus Christ and ruling and reigning over this world. And even though it's sinful conditions, it's, it's, it's not going to be us. Thank God. We'll be past that. But there's just a lot of folks, that, and, and Paul recognized that, that all they care about is earthly things, and, and they're, they're God, whose God is their belly, and... Well, they just don't believe that, they just don't believe the Lord's going to come through for them. The Lord's going to come through for you. He really will. Uh, and it says they use good words and fair speeches to deceive you. Yeah, all most of those people are called kingdom builders. <laughs> yeah. The thing about kingdom builders is, well, that joy in their heart usually turn around. And they're killing you for it. Kingdom builders will kill you. Roman Catholics killed. Communists kill. Um, uh, Muslims, kingdom builders, will kill you. Okay? About the only ones that haven't been, uh, were, have not been kingdom builders are Baptists. We're not kingdom, we don't believe we're building the kingdom down here. We're, we're, it's a rescue operation. You, any denomination, even uh, Calvin, uh, when he got control of, an, of, of a certain area, it was it uh, Switzerland, no. Switzerland, um, huh? Geneva, Switzerland. Yeah, Geneva, Switzerland. Um, he ended up putting some people to death for heresy. I mean, he said, "Withdraw yourself." He didn't say, you know, draw and quarter him. <laughs> you know, you can take you can take some things too far. But um, kingdom builders will kill you. I'm not a kingdom builder. I'm not building. I'm not. I'm not trying to bring in a kingdom. I'm trying to get out of here with as many people as I can. All right. They use good words and fair speeches. That's that silver tongue guy that you know seems so wonderful. He's motivational, positive, smooth. He's eloquent, but it's blather, and you got to be able to recognize that. Um, look at Titus two eight. Now, there are, just, there are some preachers, and I'm definitely not one of them. There are some preachers that really can, they really can deliver it smooth. I envy them. Um, I wish I could deliver it smooth like they do with all the, those, those words that are just perfect and picked out, and it's just right there for them. Just, they can just say it whenever they want, you know. I hate them, actually. Um, Paul says here in Titus chapter 2, verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil to say of you. He talks about having sound speech. Now, that sound speech is not good words and fair speeches. That's not what he means by, by sound speech, and I'll, and I'll show you why. Remember, the man that's telling you um, that they deceive with fair, uh, good words and fair speeches Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 11, 6. 2 Corinthians 11, 6. He says, But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Paul's rude in his speech. You know, Dr. Ruckman was accused of that all his life ministerial life of being rude in speech. 
So, did he tell you the truth? Then it was sound. What do you care? I mean, some people just get so worked up over the way something said, but if it's the truth, I mean, that's what you want, right? But now you've got to have them just scratching your ear. Oh, yeah, I can't stand that stuff, man. I can't stand the vomit coming out of the pulpit. Just, ugh. I mean, just tell me straight. Just, just give it to me. You know, cross, cross the plate. And men that have done that, I've always, I mean, let's face it, man, Brother Estep, he did, he, I mean, he, he drew you right between the eyes with it. Y'all know that, right? How many of you sat under Brother Estep? Okay, you remember. I remember them days. We saw, uh, you saw Mellow Estep. Okay, last five years of his life, that was Mellow Estep. You never saw Estep. Oh, man, he'd come running down them aisles, man, get right in your face. Tell you if you didn't like it, hit the door. I mean, I'm being serious. Rude. Rude. But every time he was telling me the truth, I'm like, man, he's telling me the truth. Telling me the truth. I don't care how it's delivered. I really don't. Now, I know when I'm being buffaloed, and I know when I'm not getting something, I'm just hearing a bunch of, you know, clatter. Um, in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, he says, For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech contemptible. <laughs> contemptible. Now, I don't know if they mean that the speech itself is contemptible or who he's, who he's talking about. He's um, holding them in contempt, I guess. Because I'll tell you why. Look what he says in... Titus 1, verse 11 to 13, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And guess what? That is sound speech. He just took a people from an island and those people weren't his race and he said they're liars, they're evil beasts they're slow bellies the lot of them and that's sound speech because it was true you know in America you're not allowed to believe anything is true anymore you got to toe this line that no matter what you see, no matter what you... I mean, if you see it and can document it, it's still not true. It's, it's not true. It's like, you know, the, these, these riots are mainly peaceful and there's a blaze behind the guy. Yeah, yeah. Mainly peaceful and the whole town's afire. City's on fire. But it's not true. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Paul, he's telling you the truth. But, buddy, when it came time, he'd hold some in contempt. All right, verse 19, he says, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, in your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And there's something there. Um, first, Things aren't as complex as you think, right or they're wrong. Okay? And, and we're not talking about doubtful disputations. We're talking about things are right and things are wrong. Um, even where your conscience may get it wrong, the scriptures don't. And we have the scriptures. So, but I know what's right and wrong, there it is in front of you. You don't need anybody to complicate homosexuality and try to convince you it's right when the Bible says it's wrong. It doesn't matter if you know why it's wrong. He it says it's wrong. There are a lot of things in there you may look at and think, well, I wonder why that's wrong. Well, you either trust God by faith and say, well, God says it's wrong, so it's wrong. That's the end of the argument. Um, should you go and investigate every perversion, sexual perversion, and deviate, deviate out there? No. Why don't you just take God at his word? 
Don't become an expert in evil. Become an expert in the scriptures. Because the closer you get to that, the, the worse off you're going to be. And there's some people, they just love to dig and find out, you know, exactly how dirty and, and evil it is. The problem is that, you know, that dirty and evil is penetrating your head and heart. Um, except the scripture is the last word on it. You're not to immerse yourself into, into the culture like Solomon did. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Look at this. Got to thinking about him. And the Lord allowed him to do it, and the Lord used it um, to write a 12-chapter uh, book called Ecclesiastes. But man, it had a negative effect on him. Um, that's, that's, this is exactly what Solomon did. He immersed himself in the culture of, of evil. In Ecclesiastes, look at ver, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. It says, And I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. Now you think, well, yeah, he's just searching out wisdom. There ain't nothing wrong with that, Brother Mike. But look at verse 17. I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. Folly is foolishness. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. And when we say he gave himself to it, he gave himself to it. Look at uh, chapter 2. Let's read verses 1 to 3. I said in mine heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. He wants to laugh. Therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men that they should... Uh, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. Now, he does get to the end of this thing. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. By that time, Solomon is a wreck. He is a wreck. He has 700 wives and 300 concubines. He has everything a man could ever want. He has tried everything that a man could possibly try on this earth. Every kind of pleasure you can even imagine. I guarantee you Solomon put his mind and heart to it. And it ruined the man. By the time you get past Ecclesiastes, or get through with Ecclesiastes, this man is an idolater because they turned his heart. He is a whoremonger. I mean, I don't know of a greater definition when a man's got 300 concubines and 700 wives. I don't know what else you'd call him. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> um, and he's a type of the Antichrist. He goes from a type of Christ to a type of the Antichrist in the scripture. Why? He wasn't simple concerning, concerning evil. He indulged himself in it. He researched it. I'll tell you what, you know, the reason why we don't see so many men that come out of the system that have lived that kind of life, it, the reason it's rare is because they can't make it out. They can't control themselves long enough to make it out. And there's very few that have. You know that and I know that. I don't go to the prison like I'm going to bring her here to the church we're going to raise up a, an army of preachers. I know, I know better than that. If I get one to preach, I'm happy. Why? They have immersed themselves in something that ruins them. They are not simple concerning evil. They know the con construct of it from the top to the bottom. They know it better than they know righteousness. And that's a problem. So don't be too quick to find out everything. Don't try to research something that is so dark that it's going to mess with your mind later on. Just leave it alone. Just accept what God says about it. It doesn't matter what the world says. God tells you about these things. You don't need to even ask him, uh, ask him any more about it. He, he says not to even talk about those things which are done in secret. There are certain things that, you know, really we've gotten so used to just discussing everything, and we probably shouldn't. Anyway, never go to a dark place to learn about the light. 
You don't need to go there. And if they say, well, they'll, they'll say I'm approved. They'll say, they'll say that, you know, I'm a goody two-shoe. Let them. That's a, man, that, those are good words. You know? Especially if they call you a goody two-shoe, you know. I mean, oh, you think you're a goody two-shoe. You've never done anything. You've never experienced anything. Yep! And keep it that way. Keep it that way. Let me tell you something. The prodigal son that went off, I can guarantee you that his life was never the same after that. I don't care if he made it back to the father and the father threw his arms around him and put a ring on his finger, you know, and, and gave him a seat and, and all this. Number one, he didn't have any inheritance left because he blew it. That didn't change. And the other thing is, he'll never get out of his mind of being, being, living with the hogs. And when you, when you live in this world and you let it get to you and you, go and you start digging down into the dirt and digging down into the sewage, you're never going to get that out of your mind. It's always going to be with you. You know when you tell your children, honey, you don't need to know that right now. That's not something you need to know. God's telling you the same thing. Honey, you don't need to know that right now. Just believe that it's wrong. And don't do it. Yeah, uh, last thing is, you know, you don't need to understand a perversion to know it's a perversion. You're in close, close enough proximity to the world trying to win the loss that you can smell it from a distance. That's enough. You can, you can smell it. You, you know it's there. You, you, you haven't seen it's how horrible it is, but you know it's there. And that's enough. Because we've got to get close to them, but we don't want to get too close. Okay, um, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. There's another ending, <laughs> but it ain't the end, right? Um, this bruising that he talks about there doesn't happen until the second advent. Now, there's some... Some preachers that are uh, teaching that it happened at Calvary, but it really didn't. Because he's telling them here in the book of Romans that, he, that shortly, shortly, <laughs> he'll bruise Satan under your feet. You know? That means it hadn't happened yet. It couldn't have happened at Calvary if he's still telling them, well, it hadn't happened yet, but it's going to. Um, now, there's parts of this where he's talking to us, I'm like, do I literally get to put my boot on his head? Well, I know the Lord is going to literally put his uh, foot on his head, smash his head. I don't know if each of us get a shot at him or not. Hopefully we do. But you got to understand that sometimes, when, you know, he didn't, it doesn't mention his head there as he says you'll bruise Satan. Well, what you're bruising is everything that involves him, his kingdom. Um, his forces will be annihilating his forces. Uh, look at the, I'll give you some verses here and then we'll, we'll quit for the night. Psalms, let me just read these to you because uh, I've got a few of them here. Psalm 68, verse 18 to 21. It says, Thou hast ascended on high and hast led captivity captive. That's first coming. Thou hast received gifts for men, first coming. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Blessed be the Lord who... Uh, daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. But, okay, all that stuff may have had something to do with uh, the, the uh, church age, but God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such as one as goeth on still in his trespasses. Psalm 110, verse 5 and 6 says, The Lord... Uh, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He's going to go through them like a, knife, a hot knife through butter. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. You see, you, what you have is a satanic kingdom, a satanic system. And we come back, we're stomping it down. Listen, at Armageddon, he is literally trampling his enemies. Him and that horse, man. It says the blood's all the way up to, the, uh, to his garment, uh, to the horse's bridle. It's splattering his garment. 
Who is this that cometh from Bozrah, whose uh, raiment's dipped in blood? Um, Revelation 12, 3, There appeared a wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Or this thing talks out like seven different kingdoms. Um, and he is wounding the head of those kingdoms. Now, uh, let, me, let me read this one to you. Habakkuk 3.13. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation in, unto the neck. So, again, kind of lures to the fact that there's when you talk about a head, a head of state, you're talking about a kingdom. And there's more involved than just busting him in the head. But here, and I don't understand this. Psalm 74, 14, I don't understand this completely. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. What does that mean? Now, you know when that happens, right? That's the middle of the week. And Zechariah eleven seventeen just happens in the middle of the week. He says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. He gets a head wound. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. In fact, it kills him. <laughs> He's, he, he rises from the dead. But it's amazing that when it talks about those two things, he said, Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan. Now, he's got seven. But then he says he, you know, he break us the head of Leviathan in pieces and gave us them to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. That's those Jews that are out there being fed for 42 months. Huh? <laughs> you know, they said that man, it was angel's food. Yep, now they get devil's food, so. But I, mean, I don't know. You say, what is it, brain matter? I have no idea. Is it literal? I don't know. Might be. Not if you're hungry. Doesn't bother me none. Serve it up, man. Serve it up with some hot sauce. We'll eat it. If it's if it's if it's the Leviathan's head, definitely, man. Just the fact that he got smacked. Anyway. Um you know you got these examples all through your Bible. You've got Abimelech. Remember Abimelech, who's a type of Antichrist, a woman takes the part of a millstone. That's interesting. There's another passage of Scripture that deals with Babylon. It says that God cast a millstone into the sea, and it was violent. He said that's the violence he was going to have toward Babylon. And then somebody takes a millstone or a portion of one, throws it down on Abimelech, and cracks him in the head and kills him. You know how Jesus used the example of that millstone is if you molest children and near you have an antichrist that's probably a, a, a queer and you have a system of Babylon that's been molesting children for probably the last 1,500 years. He said, well, I know some Baptists and so do I. And most of them went to prison for what they did. But there are thousands and I mean thousands of Roman Catholic priests that never got that never spent a day in jail and never went to court thousands of them there were 3,000 at one point there were 3,000 complaints in the United States of child molestation in the Catholic Church huh yep they covered it up it's interesting here when he talks about the violence that he's going to do against Babylon, he talks about casting a millstone into the sea, and that's exactly what Jesus said about molesting children. It'd be better that a millstone be tied around your neck, you'd be cast into the sea. And it's interesting that a that portion of a millstone cracks this guy in the head. <laughs> uh, Sisera, type of the Antichrist, what happened to him? Jail nailed him to the floor. Goliath. Type of Christ, David nails him with a stone, head wound kills him. So you got three types right there. Okay, that's the second ending to this book. We got two more to go.
And uh, hopefully the rest of this, um, uh, man, I should be able to get through that. I don't know. I think, I'm, oh, I'm going to breeze through this. And then I'm like, oh, there's no way. All right, any questions about what we covered? Any comments?